Welcome to Write Good, the podcast that helps you write good. I'm R.S. Benedict. Why do we love horror so much? On the surface, it makes no sense. Why would anybody enjoy media that focuses on upsetting, grotesque topics? Why would anybody want to be afraid? In this episode, Lauren Rhodes joins us to talk about how horror helps us find beauty in darkness. Now, Lauren, I understand that you're a bit of a ghost hunter. That's true. Yeah, tell us about that. That's wild. Well, it started, geez, when I was a kid. Uh, I have a cousin that died when we were both very small, and I kind of felt like she was a guardian angel overlooking me. So Mm. one of my, I don't know, first memories, strongest memories, I guess, from elementary school is my friends and I got together and tried to do a seance and tried to contact her. And so I've been looking for answers from the other side for a really long time wow now how did how did your parents take that were they like not well (laughs) yeah i can kind of see parents going like oh my god Mm -hmm. well you know this was before the craft came out right so you were like way ahead of the curb my my friend that (laughs) knew how to do a seance was of course a fire and brimstone baptist so i now i think that's kind of odd but at the time it made sense I can kind of see it probably like spending all, t- all the time in church learning about, oh, and here are the things that the enemy does and taking mm-hmm. notes like, okay, the enemy does seances. How do I taking do that? Taking notes. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> taking notes, seances, uh, Iron Maiden. Mm-hmm. Um... <laughs> yeah. And uh, I know that for a while you also published a nonfiction zine called Morbid Curiosity. So... You have a natural curiosity for morbid, spooky stuff. What is it about the morbid, about death, and all those other spooky things that draws you? And how do you find beauty in it? I think there's a lot to be said for the opposite side of birth, right? Uh, we're right. all born, we're all going to die. And I I don't really understand this fear of it. Um, you know, maybe it's because right. I don't believe in fire and brimstone, but... You know, it's a natural thing. So this, especially American fear of yeah, what's going to happen to us all, you know, you can spend your whole life dreading it, or you can just accept that there's an end point and try and pack as much in as possible. And that's kind of what I'm doing with my life is, you know, I don't like to get, let a sunny day go by. I like to get out and walk in graveyards and you know smell the flowers and listen to the bird song and all of that and that's been true for pretty much my whole life I grew up on a farm and and you learn really early on that you know death is coming and not to Mm -hmm. get too attached you know I, I think the Buddhists have it right that attachment is suffering and so you can love things but even as you love them you know that they're temporary does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, that does make sense. And I I don't think it struck me until my father passed away just how little space there is for death or grief or bereavement in American culture. Exactly. And, you know, when you lose someone, you, the clock starts ticking. All right, it's been two weeks. Aren't you over that yet? No. Yeah, it's super fast. I had like a week and then two weeks later, people were like, why are you still upset? It's yeah. Like, what? It's been two weeks, and it was my dad. What the fuck? Exactly. My my brother died, geez, almost 18 years ago. I guess it was 18 yeah. years ago. And it still hits me, you know? Oh, it's yeah. it's like I lost a limb, and yeah, I'll be going along just fine. And then the anniversary of his birthday is in October, and I was just leveled. You know, he's been gone 18 years, but I still want to pick up the phone and talk to him. Oh, totally. Totally. 
Oh, gosh, all the time. And you look at other cultures that have elaborate grieving rituals, and Americans kind of look down on it as spooky or morbid, but I'm like, you know what? They had it right. Well, the whole... <laughs> absolutely have it right. Day of the Dead thing, where once a year you bring out the pictures and you tell the stories and you keep those people alive. I, I think that's amazing. It's a shame that we it's don't have beautiful. something... Right, exactly. We don't have anything like yeah. that. And so, you know, it's... I don't know if that's from religion that they've gone on to a better place and so you don't have to think about them anymore but when my right. grandmother died uh, I was trying to console my aunt who was who was really upset and she got angry at me because grandma mm. was in a better place and she wasn't suffering and it, you know it wasn't that my aunt was missing her it was that I think some jealousy that she hadn't gone on to that better place as well. And I, I, wow. that was foreign to me. Look, you're in pain right now. Let me comfort you right now, right, right. here. But that wasn't appropriate. So, yeah, yeah. And there's also that strange, uh, like American hyper optimism where it's like, you can defeat anything if you put your mind to it, ex- well, but that you, whole, you can't defeat death. This whole concept of illness is a battle where, you know, you're going to fight it and right. you're going to arm yourself and battle it and you know uh, there is a lot to be said for optimism when i was pregnant i was really yeah. really sick and i i cut through the whole thing by thinking well today was a bad day but tomorrow i'll be better and i think if i yeah. ever understood how much danger i was in i would have been really terrified but i i didn't let right. myself think of that right which you know doesn't right. talk about morbid curiosity at all <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but th- th- I, when I started doing the magazine, I started my publishing career sort of by accident. We met the people that published the research books in San Francisco. They gave a lecture and we went. And at that point, they were looking for uh, assistance to help carry boxes around, you know, pack books for in the mail and things like that. And so we volunteered because we didn't really know anybody. We just moved to San Francisco. And the book they were putting out at that point was Modern Primitives. So I got started with AJ opening it up and, and you know, showing me the piercings and the tattoos and everything. And um, at that point, I was kind of a farm girl, like straight off the farm. So I'd never seen anything like that. But the they inspired me because... They were just running this whole publishing industry out of their apartment. They had a back room that was their office. And and I thought, geez, if it's that easy, I can do it. So this was back in the era when everybody was doing a zine. And I thought, you know, I could make a zine. What do I want to get in the mail? And kind of what I wanted was confessional stories from strangers. So Mm. what do I call this thing? And, you know, obviously the only title that ever occurred to me was Morbid Curiosity. So it was an yeah. a, a annual zine that came out in May, and uh, each issue was full of confessional nonfiction. It was a joy to put together. Yeah, that sounds really, really interesting. It was fascinating. You know, I didn't put many restrictions on people. I'm just tell me a story. You know, it doesn't have mm. to be scary or gross or horrifying, but they often were. Um, mm. Just tell me a story and and make me feel like I was there with you. I, you know, I wanted to have all the tropes of fiction, dialogue and description and characterization. And, you know, you know from writing fiction that making an eye point of view come alive is really hard. You know, if you can't stand in front of the mirror and describe how you look or something like that. So, uh, you know, I was amazed at the people that would uh, confess just the most amazing things. And uh, I learned a lot about storytelling by putting the magazine together. Yeah, that sounds really, really cool. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, I've seen some studies that show that horror fans in particular are handling the pandemic a little bit better than other people. Why do you think that is? Like, how do you think horror can help us be a little more well-adjusted? I think we all sat down like the first week of the pandemic and read Contagion or watched Contagion on Netflix and (laughs) (laughs) did our research. Okay, what do we need to do here? Um, Right. uh, You know, I just, 
I, I think if you are aware of death, then you're maybe more likely to put your mask on and take precautions and wash your hands. Yeah. You know, if you're in complete denial that you are young and healthy and never going to get sick, then you're likely to take risks and be exposed to something. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of that, like, oh, I'm healthy. I eat kale. I'll be fine. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. you're healthy, but you're not immortal. Right. Well, uh, you know, there's been a lot of disinformation, too, about right. it not being any worse than the flu. Well, people die of the right. flu all the time. Right. <laughs> right. People do. I mean, it kills a lot of people. Yeah. It's not just a little sniffle, but eh. anyway. So let's start talking a little bit about the idea of catharsis. Uh, this is a super important term in literature. It sort of goes back to Aristotle's poetics. He refers to catharsis, a term which he does not bother to define. Thank you, Aristotle, that's helpful. But it means like purging or cleansing. Now, according to him, tragedy is all about, and I mean tragedy in an artistic sense, uh, tragedy as a, as a literary form, is about catharsis, a purging of the emotions, particularly pity and fear through an imitation of serious actions. And he recognizes that this catharsis brings a pleasure itself, even though it is through the arousal of emotions that people normally consider negative. Pity is considered a negative emotion, as is fear. And he was also really, really strict about stressing that this arousal of pity and fear, it's not supposed to be by spectacle alone. It The spectacle's kind of cheap and trashy, he thought. It has to be by the plot, by the events. And he says, actions capable of this effect must happen between persons who are either friends or enemies or indifferent to one another. If an enemy kills an enemy, there is nothing to excite pity either in the act or in the intention, except so far as the suffering in itself is pitiful. So again with indifferent persons. But when the tragic incident occurs between those who are near or dear to one another, if, for example, a brother kills or intends to kill a brother, a son his father, a mother her son, a son his mother, or any other deed of the kind is done, these are the situations to be looked at for by the poet. So he recognizes the most painful, uncomfortable, transgressive stuff brings that catharsis most effectively. It's the hardest, most horrible stuff the stuff that's i think closest to horror (laughs) now the idea of purging and catharsis this this draws back to traditional humorism the belief in the four humors and that uh illness is caused by an imbalance of one of the humors so you have to purge it that's where the the bloodletting practice comes from there's also the purging in religious ritual like exorcism it's a kind of purging your demons you're And it's important to note that at least in depictions of exorcism, as far as I know, it's not enough to cast out the demons. You have to first bring it forth to the surface and speak to it in order to cast it out. Like in the Bible, when when Christ casts out the demon, the legion, he asks it its name. He doesn't just say, like, get out. He brings it to the surface and speaks to it directly and lets it talk. So you can't get rid of the demon without facing it. You can't get real catharsis in art without confronting the ugliness full on, head on. I I think that's a really interesting um, juxtaposition too, because an exorcism is external, right? That's somebody working on the person who's possessed to take away something that doesn't belong. But catharsis is when you are feeling the the emotions even though you're not the person who's involved in the story so it's it's sort of similar but there's such a difference in who's doing the acting and who's the 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 person watching the action right right i mean with an art with art it's almost like a i don't know a a group act of catharsis the writer's definitely doing a bit of that by writing if you're writing something expressive and and i feel like the reader's doing that too to to feel that catharsis you have to be really um receptive to it and right with the exorcism it's the opposite of that it's a rejection rather than the receptiveness yeah yeah that's true that's true so let's talk a little bit about 
how horror brings us a sort of catharsis, the catharsis of horror. Well, I, I feel in my own work, and I think this is true mm. uh, in a lot of the horror that I read, I don't feel the catharsis unless I can uh, identify with the characters. If, if the characters mm. are strong and real and three-dimensional, then I get wound up in the things that are happening to them. I, I was thinking about, um, oh no, I'm going to blank on the title, uh, The Haunting of Hill House, where, mm. you know, you're, you're like wound up in the two women, that scene in bed where... You know, the, she asks, whose hand was I holding in the middle of the night? Oh, God. Yeah, the first time I read that, that was the first <laughs> book I read where I could not turn the light off all night. I had to finish reading the book because <laughs> I had to know what was happening. I was so wound up in the characters. And, you know, I think that's a brilliant book. I've read it several times and I've seen, unfortunately, all the adaptations. So I, I think I've learned my lesson on that. But... Um, yeah. <laughs> the the characters are what bring that story alive. It's really not a very complicated story. No, I mean people go to a spooky weird house. Yeah, That's it. but <laughs> well, you don't get the same effect when you're watching um, Hell House with Roddy McDowell because the characters mm. are so over the top and it's so 1970s and you know the colors are vivid <laughs> and the blood splashed around. You don't get the same catharsis because you're not connected yeah. to the characters in the same way. No, no. And there's a lot of, I think, external versus internal going on there too, mm -hmm. a sort of cheap, corny, haunted house movie. It's a lot of people reacting to spooky things, like, no, oh, right. walls are bleeding. Ah, in, right, in and Hill black cats in, being in thrown around. and Yeah. Right. In The Haunting of Hill House, I, I wish I could remember the protagonist's name, but she's this incredibly like anxious, there's so much in her already. Mm -hmm. And there's so much, like, there's such a, you can see how the house kind of gets into her and yeah. that she's so anxiety ridden and, and, and lonely and alienated that. And receptive. Like, oh God, yeah. And you get into her head so, so well. I, I just, Shirley Jackson is amazing with these kind of alienated women characters. <laughs> Oh gosh, that if you're sort of a bookish outcast girl, you're you can't help but read her exactly. stuff and go, "Oh my god." Yes, you see yourself <laughs> in that. <laughs> right, right. And she puts us inside her characters so much so that we can kind of see how the house takes over or how the the boundary between her and this this house not sane just breaks completely. <laughs> Stephen King does that too. I mean, his people mm whether you like them or not, you understand them entirely, right? You, you know, oh, Carrie, yeah. again, there's an alienated young woman, and, you know, she's not the villain in this story, not no. the way I read it. So the catharsis no. for me is when she finally snaps and, you know, gets back at everybody who's to been tormenting her. Oh, absolutely. Just sets all of her classmates on fire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good for her. Well-deserved fire. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. But that was something we saw uh, when I was doing Morbid Curiosity. Every year we'd have a release party and like a hundred people would come. It, they'd be these huge events. And people would um, they'd get so wound up in the story. I mean, there's a moment when you're doing a reading and you hear the audience go quiet, and you know that you mm. finally got them. They're trapped now. Um, nice. What, yeah, one of the stories we we did really early on was uh, a friend of mine who is not a writer had written a story about the AIDS epidemic, and he helped a, a friend's suicide. And mm. you know, it was it was a horrible time, and it's a horrible story. But there's flashes of humor in it, and people were so uncomfortable as they were listening to it. They were so wound up in the characters in the story and my friend telling the story. And, you know, just they didn't know how to react. They were on the edge of bursting into tears. But there were bits that were funny. And at one point he had to stop and say, look, you can laugh. It was funny at the time. <laughs> it's, you know, they, they they had to have that black humor to 
survive the experience. And that was the permission that the audience needed. Everybody just burst out laughing and they laughed through the right. whole thing. And, you know, I never heard so much applause at the end. People really, I don't know, they need that connection, I guess, to the story and maybe the permission yeah. to respond to it, too. Yeah, yeah, I do think when, when someone's telling a story that is their own something, I mean, it's such a sensitive subject, too. It, yeah. It is kind of helpful to go, oh, that is kind of funny, but am I, should I laugh? Will he get really mad? Is it, will he get mad at me? Like, yeah, you can laugh. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I think especially when the person's right in front of you. Yeah. So I don't think it's, it's a super complicated point to say the horror we love most is the stuff that personally gets under our skin. Like I found Catholic friends of mine get way more from The Exorcist than I do. For me, it's just like, oh, it's a spooky movie, but any friend who was raised Catholic is going to hide under the blanket mm-hmm. and sleep with the lights on after watching The Exorcist. That's how I feel about ghost stories is I've had some spooky experiences. So ghost stories really set me mm. off. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. For me, it was hereditary. That movie set me off in a way that, like, a movie has not set me off in a long, long time. I, my hands were shaking when I was coming out of the theater, watching that going like, oh my god. So if you watched it a second time to see if you get the same response? I have not. I don't, I don't know if I am Once ready. was enough. <laughs> <laughs> it was really good, but that experience was very difficult. Extremely difficult. <laughs> Oh, plus I'm I'm alone in my apartment with my cats. Then I was with friends, so <laughs> mm-hmm. the cat m- runs around at night, makes a sound. I just panic. Oh God. <laughs> so most most art, I think, can bring us to a sort of catharsis. But I feel like horror has this really unique ability. Harley, Harley, no, cat, <laughs> Harley, please work with me. Okay. So I feel like horror has this kind of unique ability to not just simulate external events, but also to simulate emotional, internal events and processes with these fantastic or symbolic elements in a way that is kind of hard for a lot of other genres to do. Like horror has the opportunity, I think, to... (laughs) Kat, are you seriously doing this right now? Harley, Harley, this is not what I pay you for. He's such a bad kitty right now. He's such a little monster. And that's why we love them. <laughs> yes, he's such a terrible boy. Um, but what horror can do is... <laughs> Seriously, every time I talk, every... I just, I'm going to squeeze you. I'm going to pick you up and I'm going to squeeze you so you can't. Okay, okay, I, I'm squeezing him now. All right. <laughs> but horror has this unique ability to, to, I think, engage with symbolism in a way that is a little more challenging for more traditional genres, right? I mean, every every horror story, every kind of monster is usually just some kind of symbolic inner demon cast out. So I feel like horror gives us a really unique special catharsis and that it can, assim- can simulate these very internal, very invisible emotional events in a way that other stories can't. I think you're exactly right. <laughs> Oh, you're breaking my heart, Cat. Oh. <laughs> no, Cat. Cat, you're going to tell everyone that I'm a bad cat owner. You're going to make everyone sound, think that I'm neglectful and you're just you're just a you're just a whiny baby. That's the truth. Oh my god. <laughs> well, I think horror is horror stories were the first stories, right? Sitting around the campfire right. back in the day there were any number of things out there who were likely to eat you and Mm. you know you're dead if you didn't do right by them might come back and take you with them and and uh, you know i think those things go to the heart of being human that yeah you know we are afraid of things and we have always been afraid of things and horror kind of inoculates you a little bit you can be afraid safely and figure out, you know, all right, I'm not stupid enough to go down in the basement by myself. I've learned something from <laughs> this. Um, the the year I went to the first Haunted Mansion retreat, we entertained ourselves by coming up with this whole long list of things. You know, you don't 
open the crawl space. You don't walk down the dark path by yourself. You don't go up in the attic alone. You know, all these things that we've learned from horror movies, like, you know, Screen does that too. But um, that was the first time I'd been in person where, you know, we were ticking each other off. All right. You were um, clearly the second person to die because you did something you weren't supposed to. (laughs) And, um, and I thought I was going to be the final girl. I was going to make it through the whole weekend and not do anything stupid. And then in the very end, the last day, there was a, a swimming pool uh, on the property that was uh, spring-fed. And it had been built, I think, in the 20s when the mansion was built. But oh wow, they didn't use it anymore. It was just, it was still there and it was still full of water. But it, there were fish and newts and all kinds of creatures living in it. And so... The, the last day I was down there poking the old swimming pool with a stick. And they said, that's oh, it. Oh, yeah, you, you know, definitely get bit by a monster Right, there. you've broken the surface of the water and gotten the monster's attention. You were not going to survive this weekend. And, and you yep. know, so it's... Hand comes out of the water, grabs you. Exactly. Right. We've seen that movie, right? We know how that ends. <laughs> so... Yep, yep. She sees something in the water and it's a hair and it's a woman's face and she opens her eyes. Exactly. <laughs> and so, you know, that's the first story in, in my story collection. <laughs> I was very inspired. But, of course. You know, it's just when you see a horror movie, you know, you either are really wound up, the characters are doing the sorts of things that you would do. And so what happens to them feels very personal to you. Or, it, like the Blair Witch does nothing for me because I, I grew up in the country and I know how to get myself right. out of the woods and those people are really stupid and deserve to die. And so, <laughs> right. you know, I'm totally on the witch's side on this one. So, yeah. <laughs> you had a map, guys. You have a river. You threw it away. You I know, didn't make you do that. A river only runs two directions. You walk one of them. Eventually, you're going to find your way out of the wilderness. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, Um, yeah. I I feel like, you know, because those are the oldest stories, those are the ones that that really do, I don't know, boost us up, Mm. give us some survival techniques that, you know, people who read romance probably have more escapism, maybe, than we do. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) They're not looking into every dark shadow, but, uh, but, you know, when, when it comes down, We've watched horror movies. We've read horror stories. We know how to survive. Right, right. Yeah, which I think does bring us back to the pandemic again. Mm -hmm. Like thinking about like, oh, these masks are uncomfortable. I want to take it off. I'm thinking of every vampire movie I saw as a kid where someone takes down the garlic from the window. It's like, oh, it smells. I don't like it. Or Alien, (laughs) you know, where you know you're not supposed to break quarantine, but you bring him in anyway. Right, right, right. Ripley's going, Th- there's quarantine. You can't break quarantine. No, we got to bring it in. Exactly. Oh, should have listened to Ripley. Yeah. Cat, what are you doing right now? Why? Why? Cat, <laughs> you are doing this on purpose. I need to destroy this right now. <laughs> he, he needs to attack an empty can as loudly as possible right this second. He's starting... A, an avant-garde per, one-man percussion band <laughs> by himself. Now we have a soundtrack. Yeah, we do. We have a percussion. We have a, we have a drum soundtrack. Good kitty. Good cat. All right. He's just being terrible today. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, that is him. I asked, I asked listeners, like, should I edit out the cat? And they said, no, keep him in. He, he has freedom of speech. Do not do not censor the cat. So he, I guess, he wants to be in this podcast real bad. So I guess I'll have to leave him in. Fair enough. All right. Okay. So there's also something uh, that I think is fantastic about horror is that it can kind of lead, take the protagonist to a place beyond normal experience or normal existence, and the fantastic elements can kind of do that in 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 a way that's sort of hard to do in other genres. And something that I find really interesting in horror is that you can get these strange, cathartic, or transcendent endings that kind of go beyond happy endings. And I feel like they're more exciting than happy endings for me. I'm, I'm thinking of stories or, or movies with cathartic or transcendent endings. An example might be The Witch, 
uh, which came out a couple of years ago. The Telltale Heart, or um, or a lot of Poe, I think, has a really cathartic ending where everything just goes like, Rah! Mask of the Red Death, I feel, is a, an extremely cathartic ending. Um, and, and I think H.P. Lovecraft's The Whisperer in Darkness. Shirley Jackson does this too. Uh, a lot of her stories just end with a protagonist absolutely losing their shit and becoming something that's so far beyond ordinary human existence. Um, we have always lived in the castle. I mean, our protagonist starts at the very edge of reality as it is. And by the end of it, she's still alive, but she's basically become a ghost or a monster. She's just abandoned everything. So we have this amazing opportunity to send our protagonists beyond everything, beyond the norms of human existence, beyond nature, beyond sanity, beyond morality, beyond civilization. And there's a wonderful, wonderful freedom in that that I feel like you often don't get with sort of a simple happy ending mm -hmm. from another genre. Well, Jeff Vandermeer does that in Annihilation, where, oh yeah, you know, everything the all the laws all the rules are gone and something new is coming into being um but it's beautiful now my cats are going to bang down the door so <laughs> oh good yes hello this I is a cat you. heavy episode apparently <laughs> now that harley's quiet they decided this is this episode is uncatted we need yes. to we need to help out I have two, and so now <laughs> one of them's going to come. And the other door's closed too, Cat. There's going to be drama. Oh. I'm sorry, lost my train of thought there. But anyway, that's okay. I, I, Recording the bonus episode, uh, the last guest had a had a dog jingling around in the background. Just a dog <laughs> with like a jingly collar, just jingle jingle. I'm like, I hear that. I hear a dog jingling. That's okay. <laughs> and for me, I feel like those holy shit cathartic horror endings, I find them a lot more satisfying than a simple happy ending. Just because I feel like a happy ending is a little easier to get in a way, because it's like, okay, give the give them what they want. Yeah. The end. But, like, pulling off a cathartic ending, it, I mean, you have to build so much and put the protagonist through so, so, so much. Well, and and it's so far beyond the norm. It's a balancing act, too, because I think a lot of Lovecraft mm -hmm. stories, the characters lose their minds and then they they become ridiculous right then they're funny right. not scary anymore and so <laughs> you know hitting that ending where everything's gone apeshit and not going beyond it into comedy is tricky yeah yeah he could he could get a little a uh, little bit purple yeah <laughs> maybe that's it you know, maybe the same campy. story told with fewer adjectives would <laughs> oh absolutely i i still find them kind of fun despite his his many flaws yeah but i think what i love about these cathartic endings in horror is that you get to go beyond morality and civilization in a way that you kind of can't for a happy ending to have a happy ending wherein the protagonist has gone completely mad and become something contrary to human civilization like wow I don't I don't know about that, but there's this incredible freedom in just the complete letting go of your humanity and happily embracing the void um, that that horror allows. Like I'm thinking of the movie The Witch. I don't know if you saw it, but spoiler alert to those of you who haven't seen The Witch. Oh my God, go see The Witch. Um, <laughs> she becomes a, a witch, <laughs> and. It's after a, a really long period of just going through absolute nightmare and hell, and she's finally happy, but it's by abandoning humanity and by abandoning God. And the movie's very careful to show us that this isn't an easy decision, that this isn't like a moral decision. She's not like cute 1990s Melissa Joan Hart Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Like she is definitely going to fly around and eat babies. Like, Tomasin is 100% going to eat a baby after that movie is done. <laughs> but without that, it wouldn't be quite as satisfying, mm -hmm. I feel. Like, mm -hmm. part of the joy in, in it for me, at least especially as a woman, is watching a woman finally decide, I'm not going to be good anymore. 
Well, I think a lot of people love the original Wicker Man for that very reason. Yes. You know, I, you, it seems like you're supposed to identify with the cop, but he's so miserable and unhappy. He's such a jerk. Yeah, and a jerk. And, you know, when they finally, spoiler alert, set him on fire, <laughs> that is the perfect ending. It's well deserved. Oh, God, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, you know, it, Summer Isle, you expect him to be the villain, but he's he's not in the end. He's so charismatic yeah. and cool and fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I always, when I think about that movie, too, I always think about, okay, what society does each one of these guys represent and how many murders are there? Like, all right, the Summer Isle people, they're killing one person who sucks versus how the society, how he represents the sort of like Christian United Kingdom kills how many people yeah. to maintain its way of life mm -hmm. like a lot more people i would say most of them or at least many of them innocent yeah and like how he got way more chances to escape and save himself than your average i don't know person who died in a in a workhouse in in the united kingdom in the olden days did and I'm like, you know what? I'm I'm Team Summer Isle, 100. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> At least the violence that they commit gives you apples and cool pagan sex rituals. Like that's way better. There needs to be more cool pagan sex rituals. I mean, just as a <laughs> yeah. baseline. Yeah, like you you left with a choice between like pagan sex sex rituals and Margaret Thatcher. Like there is no contest here. <laughs> this is not a hard decision. We know what the right choice is. <laughs> I think that leads us directly to punk rock, right? Right. Oh, gosh. My favorite movie critics, Mark Kermode, says that people think that horror fans are sadistic for wanting to watch these terrible things, but for him, horror, at least really good effective horror, is not sadism, but it's masochism. You are empathizing with the characters as they go through this and suffering with them, and there's this strange thing that happens with this collective suffering, this empathetic suffering that brings about, I guess, this Aristotelian catharsis that's once you give yourself over to it is just giddy and wonderful but why do you think it is that we enjoy this strange kind of suffering like why is it that we decide I'm gonna read a book or put on a movie that is going to make me feel scared because being scared sucks usually like what is the thrill in this it was the thing that we saw with the magazine that people would um They'd get a boost, you know. It'd be a, the, some of the topics would be really grim, and and some of the stuff that happened to people was really scary. There was a series of stories I got that were um, people's brushes with serial killers, like over the Whoa. course of a couple of issues, where you know somebody got picked up by someone who turned out later to be a serial killer, or shared an apartment with somebody that was a serial killer. You know, a couple of these things, and. It was harrowing to read them, but you knew that the person telling you the story had survived to tell you. Mm -hmm. And there was this whole sense of uh, catharsis, I guess, uh, schadenfreude, if nothing else, that <laughs> you had survived it. And, and I think that was something that came up again and again when people, this was back in the mail order days, right? So people right. had to send me a check in the mail. They couldn't just PayPal me. So if they were going to write me a check, they'd send me a note as well. And so I got to know some of the, the regular readers really well that way. And what came up again and again is that they found this all really liberating and freeing, and it made them really glad to be alive because they hadn't survived these horrible things that other people had survived. And I think horror mm. does exactly the same thing, that, you know, you... At the end of the movie, at the end of the book, 
you have survived it. You are still alive. And, right. you know, it makes, it makes everything sweeter. I mean, it's the same reason I walk in graveyards. You know, the air is fresh and clean and the grass is green and it's really good to be alive. So um, I think horror save, serves the same kind of memento mori purpose that you're reminded mm-hmm. that the end is coming, but it hasn't come yet. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you used that phrase, memento mori. Um, Do you want to talk a little bit about the meaning behind that phrase for any of our listeners who might not be familiar with it? Sure. Um, It's Latin. It's it's to remind you that you will die. And it's a phrase you see um, gravestones, oh, I want to say 17th and 18th century comes up a lot as, let's see if I can get the words in the right order. Um, as I am now, so you will be, prepare for death and follow me. The whole sense mm. of um, all of us are coming to the grave. And so the best thing you can do is prepare yourself for it. And I th- I think uh, horror and, and reading nonfiction that's morbid uh, serves that same purpose. It's just a reminder that every day above ground is a good day, right? Because the alternative mm. is not all that great. Uh, whether you believe in an afterlife or not, you know, as far as we know, there's a expiration date, right? And so um, right. you you can't just hang around waiting for the pandemic to be over. You, <laughs> if you've got something you want to do, you better do it now. You know, read that book or write that story or whatever, because who knows what's going to happen. Right, right, right. Um I think artists, didn't artists of the Renaissance or the medieval artists, they were really fond of putting a sort of memento mori element in their work too, right? Like I I think we've seen a lot of strange medieval artworks of like dancing skeletons. Exactly. Yeah, the whole dance. Pretty girls dancing with skeletons. Those are pretty great. Yeah, that that came (laughs) from a mural in a cemetery in Paris. The the original dance macabre, as far as I can trace it back, um, it was called the Cemetery of the Innocents in the heart of Paris. And it was there for 600 years, I believe. Um, just a little churchyard, but they kept putting more bodies in, putting more bodies in. And, you know, eventually the flesh would all fall off the bones. They'd sift all the bones out and put them in an ossuary around the, the cemetery. But they started painting these murals of death leading everyone to the grave you know he'd he'd take the milkmaid and he'd take the queen and he'd take the uh, the knight or the merchant or the priest you know nobody could could buy off death they were all going to be led eventually to this cemetery and uh, that comes from the the black plagues in the 13th century Mm. where I can't remember now what the, the statistic is but it's one in three Europeans died, I believe. Yeah. Where, you know, people were dropping everywhere and there's there was nothing you could do. You know, they didn't know how the plague spread, so they didn't know to kill the rats and throw out the straw with the fleas in it and all of that. So either you survived or you didn't, but you didn't know why. You know, pious people died and evil people lived and, and vice versa. So it led to this sense that, you know, there's, there is no protection. Maybe the church will save you and maybe it won't, but you know, maybe you're going to die at that point. Uh, they didn't believe that you died and went to heaven. They believed you died and you hung out in the ground until the second coming. So that it was very important for them to save all these bones and, and keep them because when the trumpet sounded, you were going to need to collect up all your bits to go face final judgment so i mean, I, I find all of that really right. fascinating that yeah you know, this, yeah this, that i always thought was interesting learning like wait you didn't just go to heaven you no. you had to hang out in your grave for like a thousand years yeah, like, yeah you just did like what yeah that's that's a going to heaven is a fairly new thing <laughs> in terms of like religions in the world that you know the promise of heaven was always there but you didn't immediately go when you died you you had to wait until the final judgment came and so people Mm -hmm. were ready for the final judgment to come you know so they wouldn't have to wait for a hundred thousand years whatever 
Um, so, uh, you know, we see it now with with evangelical Christianity that you know, right. there, there are steps that have to be taken to, to bring about the end of the world. And one of them is propping up Israel. And right, you know, right. It's, it's, it fascinates me because I, I don't come down on the religious side either way. It'd be great if it's true. It'd be great if it's not true. But, but to watch how it's changed over the years is really fascinating to me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's wild. We need to go. Oh, actually, there's a big uh, uh, there's a big movement in American politics that wants to deliberately fulfill the prophecy to exactly. bring about the end of days. Like, wait, what? Yeah, God, that's just that's there. Not a like, yeah, bit that's scary. a mainstream political belief. Like, what? Yeah, yeah. There's this <laughs> whole stream of uh, conspir- conspiracy theories that Trump is the Antichrist, and we're in the final days now right. with the uh, fires and the floods and the earthquakes and everything else. Ooh. and the plagues or you know it could be uh, yet another plague and there has been plague after plague after plague throughout human human history so right i'm not in a hurry to get to the end of the world no really no no my cats won't be there at the end of the world exactly. so i don't want to leave them yeah. well, i was just uh listening to a lecture <laughs> last month about pet cemeteries and i hadn't realized that Pets weren't allowed into heaven until, like, midway through the Victorian era. Then, mm. then they changed their beliefs. Everybody decided that, no, you know, dogs can go to heaven. Dogs will be in heaven waiting for us when we get there. Right. I guess that's comforting <laughs> to know. But that's, yeah. that's... And then Don Bluth told us that all dogs go exactly. to heaven. Exactly. You know, and, and, you know Except maybe that cats... means that Cujo's in heaven, and that's intense. I don't know about that. <laughs> Now, cats are kind of jerks, so I don't know if they're going to be there or not. But um, yeah, you know that's that's just in the last two hundred years that that belief has become popular or common. Maybe popular is not the word I want. That's right. That's right. Mm. And I think horror lets us to to uh, play with those ideas, right? The the sense of religion and whether it can protect us or not, and what happens to people yeah. who don't have any religion to protect them yeah it lets us engage with these very kind of dangerous topics and and dangerous concepts in a way that's safe and simulated kind of like a roller coaster like you get to feel like you're falling but you know you're strapped in you're probably safe depending on the roller coaster hopefully it was put <laughs> together right but you're you know you're ideally you're safe and you're you're getting to engage with something at just enough of a distance and i feel that's incredibly therapeutic and helpful and valuable and i i feel that wanting to avoid that wanting to avoid that suffering is a problem um and and not a good thing because just mild pleasantness kind of doesn't get you to this really gratifying catharsis and I feel like I see in some of SFF more of a almost a movement or or leaning toward like why do we have to deal with unpleasant stuff like Mm -hmm. there's a a lot of people are denouncing what they refer to as grim dark which is stories that are really heavy and grim and depressing like a lot of people argue that the Game of Thrones series is oh it's just grim dark it's just like cruel mean bad stuff for no reason that's just needlessly empty and grim so it's bad and we need more pleasant things and i personally find that a little disturbing (laughs) yeah there's a whole movement in science fiction toward normal people's stories you know people who aren't starship captains and aren't uh, warriors or assassins or whatever that just you know janitors and normal people and I, I guess that's comforting to some people, but I find it really tedious because I spend my mm-hmm. whole life in the normal world dealing with normal people. And I'm not in the, you know, when I'm when I, looking for entertainment, that's not where I go. So, uh, you know, <laughs> different strokes for different folks, I guess. But um, yeah, my, when my space opera came out, <laughs> it was accused of being grimdark. And, uh, you know, I people die. A lot of people die, but... Right. People die in the world. I don't find that. I don't know. (laughs) I didn't think it was all that grim, but apparently. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about this on a previous episode, but uh, Kay Applegate talked about how 
when she wrote the Animorph series, how she very deliberately ended it on a sad note because she's she didn't want to send to children who were reading her books a message that war is painless mm -hmm. because she felt it would be a deeply immoral thing to tell people that like, oh yeah, war's fine, it's painless, no one really gets hurt. She's like, no. No. And I do worry that I see a little bit of a movement toward that. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I um, came through college with a, a group of women and of the four of us three of them were raped and I'm the only one who wasn't mm. but I was attacked by somebody in my dorm and wrestled to the floor and had to go wow. through uh, being bullied by the police and bullied by the university to drop the charges and on all of that and so I write about sexual assault in my work because I know people who survive that, and I'm not interested in the assault part, but I'm interested in how you survive it, you know, how you put your life back together after somebody else has stepped in and taken it apart. So uh, I think those questions are important to grapple with. You know, the yeah. fiction helps arm us to face those things in our own lives. Yeah, and I think art has such a power to give people empathy, I feel like, it's really important to explore these terrible and dark things for people who might not have gone through it. Yeah. Like part of the reason I write about sexual assault and sexual harassment a lot might be for readers who haven't gone through it, especially a clueless male reader who might not quite get, you know, you can intellectually hold the idea in the back of your head like, yeah, that's probably bad. But like, you want to walk someone through it and be like, no, this is this is how it is. And to have them see like, oh, okay. Yeah. That's what that's like. That really sucks. The second <laughs> book in the Space Opera trilogy was about um, the boyfriend, ex-boyfriend, can time travel, and he's trying very hard to fix the heroine's life, and he keeps going back and fixing things, you know, to make her life better, to make her safer, to make her happier, and, and never facing until the end that you know, it's her life. She survived it. And that's important to her. That's that's something she wants to hang on to. And he has no right to be in there messing with things to make her better, to make himself more comfortable. And uh, yeah, I, it just, if somebody reads that and, and says, Oh, wait, <laughs> maybe I'm overstepping, maybe, maybe I ought to ask her right. what kind of help she wants, then I feel like I've done my job. Right. Um, wow, this took a dark turn. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's good. That's good. I like. I I understand sometimes why kids' media might want to avoid super scary stuff, but I do genuinely worry that we might be doing psychological harm to people by shielding them mm -hmm. from too much dark or grim media. Um, and I understand wanting escapism, and I understand sometimes just wanting to sit down with, like, a light, silly, cheerful thing. I mean, I definitely have my, like, silly, cheerful things that I'll watch. In my case, I think it's nailed it. I'll watch people make some really ugly cake. Um, <laughs> that's that's my, like, silly escapist whatever show. It's just, Nicole Byer is going to make fun of somebody's cake. All right. And she's going to taste the cake and make a face because it's really bad cake. <laughs> But I do worry that I am seeing sometimes in SFF, not not in horror so much, not a, not at all in horror, because horror by its nature is designed to make you uncomfortable. But I'm seeing a lot of, I, I think the movement, they're calling it kind of like hope punk mm -hmm. and sort of in aversion to going into the dark stuff and going into the hard stuff. And I find it a little bit worrying because I'm going, okay, but what if I really want to express things in a way that feels truthful to me because I am going to go there. Well, I'm a firm believer of p people will gravitate to the the media that comforts them, you know, whether it's horror or science fiction or whatever. And I feel like the world is big enough we can have every flavor. Um, right. I don't know. If people enjoy that, that's fine. I just, I've tried twice to read some of the whole punk stuff and it Nothing happens. <laughs> like, okay, you know, if you yeah. want to read a book where nothing happens, that's great. But I don't. I, I want big stakes and important decisions and life and death. That's what I want. Yeah, yeah. It's weird. I'll see people going like, oh, I want a story about 
a healthy relationship without lots of conflict. I'm like, I don't. That's boring as shit. Right. Well, if there's a story there. <laughs> it Being in one of those is nice, but I don't want to watch like a pleasant couple go to Ikea. Yeah. I don't want to do that. Why? Why would you want this? I want extreme drama. <laughs> it's kind of mind blowing to me. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, I don't judge, you know, if, if you if your life is complex enough that you feel like you need to read books where nothing happens, then go wild. But yeah, I'm not interested in that myself. No. <laughs> I get enough drama in my real life. I, I want some I want the stakes to be upped a little bit in the fiction. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I kind of like terrible things happening in fiction for me. It, like, it, it, in a way, it is my escapism. Cause it's like, well, at least I'm not getting attacked by vampires. Yeah. Yeah, life could be worse. Could be, could be vampires. <laughs> could be a zombie plague and not just a regular plague. Exactly. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about works that really pull it off. I think we mentioned some Shirley Jackson, but... For you, what are what are some of your favorite bits of horror fiction that kind of bring this catharsis? That go to some place incredibly dark and manage to find something transcendent for you? Wow, Brian Hodges' books do that for me. He mm. he is such a beautiful stylist. His his language is just so lush and rich. And you get so wound up in the characters he creates, and then he puts them through these horrible, horrible things. And it's exquisite and beautiful. And, and um, I, don't, I don't know if Brian was Catholic growing up, but there is definitely that sense of suffering is beauty. And, uh, mm. you know, I read one of his books and I feel completely changed. <laughs> I'm working through a collection of short stories now. I'm trying to remember the title. I'm just, I should write things down because my memory is so bad. But um, <laughs> the first one is about uh, uh, people living in, oh, I want to see Tennessee, something like that. Anyway, it's a, it's a town where most people who could leave have left. And what's left mm. are meth labs and you know, people scratching gardens out of the the dirt in their backyards and trying to survive. And it it's similar to the place I grew up. And so I really identified with it. But there's a creature in the woods that demands a sacrifice. And, you know, it's, it's so exquisitely beautiful. And yet I could feel myself in that place as as things were going on and going bad um yeah i that think it's amazing yeah like let me google that super quick because brian is just amazing okay uh well while you're looking that up that kind of you mentioned a town where everyone who can leave has left mm. that makes me think a bit of abby mayotis's short story i think it's called alien love virus disaster oh my god uh it's awesome it's a super weird sci-fi horror story about this town this rural town that has like some kind of lab in the middle of it some kind of chemical plant and it erupts and everybody starts growing these strange they're like ping pong balls almost oh, under their yes. skin and it's strong she talks to one of the scientists who was in there and it's strongly implied that there's something extraterrestrial in it wow and it's these things in there are just like growing and growing and growing and there's this one son, there's this one line that's like so eerie but also kind of beautiful where because these things are growing in there it's like gr stretching their skin out she says i feel like i'm just a piece of s a thin membrane stretched between stars on the top and something as yet unknowable underneath. Mm, wow. And it's this line that I'm not quoting it perfectly, but it's incredibly eerie and spooky and wonderful. And there's, oh gosh, the ending's like just pre-cathartic. But by the time you get to the end, you're like, holy shit. Like you see something <laughs> enormous happening and it's terrifying, but wonderful mm -hmm. at the same time. That That is exactly how I feel about Brian Hodges' work. He's... He gets you so wound up in it. And um, the the book I was thinking of is Getting Into Oblivion, which was a mm. story collection from 
last year, I think, came out early last year. But all nice. of his novels are the same sort of thing where you just, you feel like you're on the roller coaster. You know, the ride takes off and you better keep your limbs inside the car because otherwise you're going to lose <laughs> something on the way. Nice. I was traveling with my parents uh, a couple of years ago. We decided to take the kind of the long way back from northern Michigan. And so we were driving down along the, the lake on the way back. And we stopped in this little farming town for lunch. And, you know, dusty little town, one diner in town. So that's where we went to eat. And everybody mm-hmm. in there had abrasions on their skin. You know, they Whoa. they were all farmers, right? So they lived rough lives, but right. they, you know, everybody looked a whole lot older than they probably actually were, and they had lumps under their skin, or you know, large pieces of skin scraped off, and band aids and bruises, and you know. I felt like I was in a Lovecraft story. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, the, the the lives that these people lead. And my dad's a farmer, so I'm used to seeing him banged up. But right, that that that's a long way from. I live in San Francisco now, and you know, normally I don't see people quite that beaten up by life. Yeah, yeah, unless their Juicero falls on mm-hmm. them. Yeah, yeah, or they you know they fall off their Peloton or something like that. <laughs> not that i'm bitter i injured myself in a tragic juicer accident exactly a bit of massaged kale got flung out of the machine and hit me in the face <laughs> almost lost an eye <laughs> all right so yeah gosh how did i forget i i didn't even mention abby mayotas in the outline thank goodness i remembered it because she's amazing i'm glad you did because i'm gonna have to go look that up i think it's on i think it's online free she's got a story collection out called alien love Di- alien love disaster virus and other stories or something like that <laughs> um but most of her work is on online for free she's one of those writers who's published in like both in literary magazines and in genre magazines so I have like so much respect for people who can do both of those because it's really, really hard, I think, to bridge that gap. And she's amazing. It's like really gritty, funny, weird, dark, spooky sci-fi, um, sci-fi horror sometimes. And it's terrific. I love her work. And she's not like super big or super famous either. She's, I think, I think it's Small Beer Press who publishes her. That makes it's like sense. an indie yeah. press. Yeah, but she's fantastic, and I, I she's one of those writers where I'm like an evangelist about their work, where it's like, okay, I want to buy someone a book, I'm gonna give her, I'm gonna give them her book because it's super weird, and I guarantee they haven't read it yet. That's how I am with Angela Carter. I mean, I, I'm on a mission mm-hmm. to get Angela Carter into the hands of everybody I can. This, you know, she's she's just not well known enough, and I think that's a crime. Yeah. Like, stop talking about all these boring writers. Read this one. This one's cool. Right. Okay. So I think we've been talking for about an hour. So let's start winding it down. Uh, Well, we've been talking for maybe half an hour. The other half has been cat interruptions. (laughs) But he's calmed down now that he's said his piece. Before we go, how can our listeners find and support your work? My homepage is laurenrhodes.com. And my name is, both names are spelled kind of weird, so... Good luck with that. Um, other than that, you yeah. can find me on <laughs> you can find me on Twitter or Instagram at Morbin Lauren, and I'm Lauren with an O. So that's that's probably the best place to look. Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for inviting me. This was fun. Glad to have you. And thank you, audience, for listening. That's all for this episode. If you like what you heard, head over to patreon.com slash write good and sign up. Subscribers get bonus content and access to the Kitty Sneezes Discord, where we hold group writing sessions and watch movies and goof off. And be sure to join us next time when we talk about the scourge of sexy baby voice. Until then, keep writing good. KittySneezes.com in color.